name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all the listeners of Urho The Way. Urho The Way is an internet-based outreach Christian ministry to disseminate the love of the triune God. My name is Father Simon Cheryl Mathai, and I'm based here out of the Northeast in the United States of America. And today I am extremely humbled with the opportunity to provide and offer the concluding part of our three-part series focusing on the discourses of more Felixinos Mabug. When you read the writings of this Blessed Father, you are taken away to a time focusing on the ascetical life and focusing on exactly how can we follow the way and the practices that we can introduce as a part of our faith to ultimately collect with our connect in the life and the fat path of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the episode that we'll focus on today, focusing on the lust of the belly, we will talk about a sin that often is overlooked in our day-to-day -day interactions, the sin of gluttony. And Morphilexinos, in two discourses, spends a considerable amount of time stridently speaking to his followers, his students, on exactly the challenges of this particular sin and how it may impede us in terms of our true calling as disciples of Christ. We are blessed to have a, a famed Syriac scholar, Dr. Robert Kitchen, who spent a considerable amount of his research and his life dedicated to the teachings of Morphilexinos, and in his writings focusing on this particular chapters and discourses, does an amazing job of providing context and showing us exactly what was happening at the time. Why was he writing these certain letters? And more importantly, walking us through exactly how uh, the lust of the belly, gluttony in itself, sets the stage in terms of how we follow Christ. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Kitchen and hope that uh, whatever we learn today is serving and well-pleasing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, Dr. Kitchen, the floor is yours for our final series. Thank you very much, um, Father Simon. And it's been a, a, a wonderful and really interesting journey here the last uh last well now it's just two weeks total but the last three saturdays to be able to uh to look at philoxenus of, of mabug and his ideas particularly those found in his uh 13 discourses as i just as sort of a review for those who may or may not have um uh, been listening the first uh, two, I began uh, reading Philoxenus um, not by my curiosity, but by the, the uh, pushing of my professor at uh, Catholic University of America, um, boy, nearly, nearly 50 years ago. Um, I caught on to his ideas. I did a master's thesis, and then years later, eventually, uh, a doctoral dissertation focusing on Philoxenus's discourses and the Book of Steps, the Syriac Book of Steps. Um, today, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I will mention the Book of Steps on a couple of occasions, but uh, by and large, we're gonna be looking again at perhaps the, the most striking of uh, Philoxenus's 13 uh, homilies, uh, the one on gluttony or the lust of the belly. Uh, the 10th and 11th Mimre of Philoxenus move us now in a different direction. You see, the first nine that we have uh, well, we've skimmed over just by necessity of time, um, the first nine are an introduction to the discipline of the Christian life. They're in pairs. So there's an introduction. And then there's um, pairs, uh, uh, two on faith, two on simplicity, two on the fear of God, two on the renunciation of the world. And these are directed, <coughs> excuse me, 
to the monks in the monasteries, as well as I, I'm still firm, firmly convinced to the laity. He is speaking, um, in fact, mostly um, uh, in, uh, to the beginning novice monks who mentally and spiritually, I think a, one way to describe it is that they're still lay people dressed now in monastic garb. Now, as noted in the first lecture, Philoxenus uh, apparently shifts uh, at this point in number nine to utilizing the eight thoughts of Evagrius Ponticus. Uh, Evagrius uh, died in 399. He was uh, a Greek who went to Egypt and became one of the uh, famed desert fathers. And he describes these eight thoughts as being the insidious thoughts or passions that persistently creep into our minds and souls uh, and hold us back from our spiritual development. Now, the first two um, of these eight thoughts, in which are found in numerous spiritual writers after Evagrius, uh, especially among Syriac writers, um, but including perhaps uh, maybe the most famous for, for many, John Climacus, are gluttony and fornication. The last two pairs of Philoxenus's discourses are on these topics, and uh, I think I can safely say he does not abbreviate his comments at all. For the four homilies, it's, it takes 272 pages. Several scholars have wondered whether uh, Philoxenus had intended to continue his series to include um, the pair, pairs of homilies on the remaining six thoughts, which are uh, greed, sadness, akedia or despondency, anger, vainglory, pride. These are, by the way, the, the, the origin of the seven deadly sins. But no manuscripts have been found with any of these hypothetical uh, meme ray attached to the name of Philoxenus. These are different in character and tone. They're attacking physical problems um, that are connected to our spiritual conduct. Now, there's way too much material as vindicated. So I'm going to limit my thoughts um, to these uh, two meme ray and really just on the first one, uh, on gluttony or ekmat karso, the lust of the belly. René Lavenon, um, in his introduction to the French revision of the homily uh, in the Source Chrétien series uh, that was published in 2007, singled out the 10th Mimro as uh, un gros orage, a huge thunderstorm, which appears to be going after abuses and convicting the, the guilty of this uh, this passion of the lust of the belly. The 11th meme row is actually entitled on asceticism, but it's still largely uh, about the management of eating, um, but it's a much more serene um, uh, meme row uh, and homily. It's guiding the monks in their path towards perfection. But I think today it's probably best. Let's just get in the middle of the big storm recaps because it is the most in, uh, entertaining sarcastic, uh, funny, and, and yes, unsettling of the entire collection. And it's also difficult for me having, you know, reading through these, these homilies, the debate about whether Philoxenus wrote these and then delivered them to all the monasteries, wrote these sermons, or whether he delivered them at first in person. I can't imagine the way this uh, reads to us that he did not deliver this at first uh, in the flesh to the monks in a, one of the monasteries. Mimro 10 seemed as if uh, Philoxenus was starting all over again. Perhaps it was more, um, more like now that I finished all the preliminary stuff, let us get down to the real business. His first words 
are that the lust of the belly is the worst and most despicable of all other passions, which is why it is the first passion. It's the first thing that really attacks us. It reduces one into the state of an animal and destroys uh, all the other virtues. The lust of the belly because becomes, in fact, the mistress of the body and, our, and accompanies our bodies down to Sheol. Now, that's saying it very strongly. It says quite a lot. But the question is, was he overstating, exaggerating, you know, his case, you know, rhetorical flourishes? We all have to eat to survive. And for most uh, of us, I can say, uh, eating is one of the great pleasures of life, socially and physically. The center of, uh, of Christian worship is the Eucharist, which is a meal. So why pick on this physical necessity in preaching about spiritual progression towards perfection? Popular medical theory of that time, uh, we can quickly pick up on this from Philoxenus's descriptions, um, favored eating a modicum of food, not too much and not too little, in order to maintain one's fitness uh, and endurance, mental and emotional alertness, and avoidance of disease to all of which Philoxenus assents and promotes, particularly for certain vocations, for students and scholars, for orators, athletes, dancers, soldiers. The thick fume of food, is his phrase, inhibits their performance, agility, and intellectual flexibility. The ideal, especially for the spiritual aspirant is a lightness of being, not being weighed down and thwarted by a physical and ultimately spiritual heaviness. So while how much you eat is a problem, the spiritual quandary here is in how you eat. Rechmach Carso the lust of the belly is not at first a matter of quality, but of an uncontrolled desire that permits uh, no other desires. It leads quickly to all manner of sinful behavior against one's soul and against, uh, against others. Philoxenus will say on a number of occasions throughout these homilies that the lust of the belly is the door, opens the door to all the other lusts. So it is the adversary of, of mercy, for one extends no mercy to anyone unless one's belly is full. And this lust is never satisfied. It's always needy. It's always greedy for something uh, perhaps another person possesses. The stomach, therefore, is never too large or too full in proportion to one's eye that, you know, we, you know, our, our appetite um, is uh, not as big as our eye. No matter how much he has, it is never enough, which is worse than the animals, because when an animal has had enough, it walks away and lies down. But a glutton worries about tomorrow, whether there will be food for him then. And so he starts planning and his thought, is again continually on food. Now, in uh, the term glutton in Syriac is ya yeah, no. It means someone who is covetous, covetous, greedy, grasping. This is where Philoxenus is at his most observant and wittiest. When the glutton sits down at a dinner table, he is suspiciously envious his neighbors on either side and perhaps across the table. He's concerned whether the person next to him or across the table is getting to eat more than him. And he starts counting the number of bites, chews that his neighbor takes to see if there is more, more food on his plate. And 
and he winces every time the neighbor takes more food because if he leaves some there on the plate, there will be more for him. The lust of the belly darkens the intellect from reflection on God and clouds the mind from the remembrance of Christ, Philoxenus observes and indicts. Do you remember that uh, simplicity is, is having one single thought? Gluttony is, in fact, um, capable of only one single thing, which is eating. Perhaps then gluttony is simple. We, you know, we can do the logic there, but it is the converse of purity and simplicity. Simplicity focuses first on God, while gluttony thinks first of food and the lust for eating. But what's the harm of that? I think that, again, we keep coming back to that, particularly, I think, today in our churches. What's the harm of that when you are hungry, and especially for those uh, who do not have enough uh, to eat? The lust of the belly, Philoxenus continues, overrules any other thoughts or ideas as worthless. It despises wisdom as a waste of time and nonsense. Philoxenus voices the, glutton, glut, the glutton's mocking voice. Have you nothing better to do than to think? What then does the glutton want? Well, again, Philoxenus is ready with, uh, with his citations. Let us eat something which God has provided and be quiet. Now, this is one of the few sentences in which the glutton mentions the existence of God. Being quiet is as close to a religious practice as the glutton gets. Again, Philoxenus quotes uh, this typical glutton as, it is sufficient for us to believe and to be silent. Now, this can be labeled as a sort of form of quietism, a movement that periodically arises in religious history, which assumes that by saying staying still, still and doing nothing and thinking nothing, everything good will come to you. A form of, you might say, spiritual anarchy that abandons involvement in love and compassion for the rest of humanity. Gluttons, therefore, he continues in his argument, we hear so much about what gluttons are and and the lust of the belly, that it's it's hard to sort of wrap these all up into a few, few uh, brief ideas. But he goes and says that gluttons are worse. They're lower than animals because animals eat, yes, but they also work. And gluttons, they just eat. They do not work if they can avoid it. On the road to perfection, um, Philoxenus never says that the perfect level, the gemire, um, should not work, uh, as the Book of Steps forbade its gemire from doing, imitating the first couple in the Garden of Eden. But here in Philoxenus, the perfect are not animals, but the implication is that they do indeed work within the com monastic community. The glutton, however, has no use for the ascetic or the monk whose very disciplined way of life embarrasses his lack of discipline. If he hears of an ascetic who has relaxed his fasting for the love of another person or because he is sick or weak and needs nourishment to continue his ascetical works and labors, then the glutton runs all over the place telling everybody he can find about so-and-so who has betrayed his vow. This is not only casting aspersions upon the monastic way of life, but it is also his way of making excuses, to distracting everybody from his own deprived laxities. Needless to say, the glutton is a relentless enemy of fasting, claiming to anyone who would listen that fasting blasphemes against God because God has provided such food for all of humanity and we reject God's gift. Now, the worst characteristic of the glutton that Philoxenus presents is that the glutton 
is dead to his soul. It's not that he makes it very clear. It's not that he does not have a soul, but since he does not stir up the soul for any form of knowledge, it is as if it, it is as if it weren't there. When the soul complains about his behavior, um, he is completely unaware of it because he's dead to it. Just as a, uh, and Philoxenus gives a, a, a stark uh, summary here, just as a living body accompanies someone dead while the dead person is not aware of it, so the glutton soul is attached to his body while he is not aware of the soul. It bears and leads around a cadaver because he lives only for pleasures and not for the soul. I think any monks hearing this, sitting in the pews uh, back in the, uh, probably in the early 6th century, uh, wondering what's for dinner that night would have sunk down in their seats terrified. After that, only halfway through the sermon, Philoxenus relaxes a little and he resorts to mockery. He starts piling up more and more the problems and the failings of one who is addicted to the lust of belly. And that's where I think we have to be uh, listening um, uh, in, in our churches and as, and as laity. The most obvious charge against the glutton is that he has made his belly God, his God. The living one is dead and has been buried in order to save you, Jesus, uh, or Jesus, uh, Philoxenus says to um, says to the glutton, "Yet you have made your body a tomb for food." If the glutton has a friend, who almost certainly has to be a, a glutton as well, and that friend, somewhere along the line, realizes what he has become, and he turns away from gluttony and from too much food then immediately he becomes the enemy of his former friend. It's not anything he has said or done or how he has behaved negatively towards his old friend, but that he no longer worships the same God, their bellies. Now, step aside for a moment here. Uh, an important question of context for these homilies is about whom is Philoxenus complaining and satirizing? Um, in this meme row. Obviously, he knows at least one person, and probably many, um, who behave this way because he's able to describe quite uh, minutely um, and hilariously uh, their, their movements and their motives. Since Philoxenus is talking about the thoughts and the passions which affect, afflict all human beings, first half of this meme row seems to describe, you might say, a generic glutton, someone who's eating at banquets and so on, which probably would not have happened in a monastery. But Philoxenus as bishop, moving around his jurisdiction, would have witnessed such events regularly and probably are part of the sharpening of his uh, observation powers. He did not really move uh, into the monastery, but gradually he describes a glutton who is involved in the church and its worship to some degree. And these are some of his, uh, I think, his best, uh, his best similes here and images. Perhaps the feet of Abraham. Remember the story with the Abraham meeting the three, um, they're, they're really three angels um, three strangers who come out of the desert and he goes and uh, prepares the fatted calf to serve them. Perhaps the feet of Abraham when love was carrying them and running to the herd in order to bring a calf to the angels were not as light as the feet of the glutton who rushes to whomever brings him food. Another good line is to the glutton, two eggs are more dear to him than the Old and the New Testaments. Hearing about vigils terrifies him. Prolonged prayers are a true torture to him. 
Philoxenus' message, now securely inside the monastery, is straightforward. Imitate the ascetics, not the gluttons. There are plenty of good people around you to follow, he reminds them. One passion is hard enough uh, for any human being, but the lust of the belly, again, goes back to the idea, opens the door to allow all the other lusts to, to enter. Money, grief, rank, anger, rage, jealousy, theft, fraud, even murder, and definitely fornication, the latter being fueled by gluttony. That's a couple more. Um, long meme rate uh, in the future. Gluttony also increases foolishness more than all the other lusts. For the veil of the intellect is too much food. The darkness of an enlightened mind is the vapor of food. So the mind is clouded and can't see the light because of the fog of uh, food that has surrounded us. But back to faith and the ultimate concern. By a table rich in its foods, they were seduced to the impure table, tables of idols. Philoxenus reminds them of Jesus' caution that one cannot serve God and mammon. Um, and similarly, one cannot serve God and the belly. So he concludes in rapid succession. He begins really at the beginning. Remember Satan, the tempter, used gluttony as Adam and Eve's weakness to make his inroads, to make them relent from their simplicity and desire the fruit that would make them equal to God. Philoxenus does specifically make note of the fact that the fruit and in Eden um, was a fig. But it was not the fruit itself, its physical substance, that causes their fall from grace, but their, but their lust for it. He warns the monks not, uh, then not to think that by avoiding rich and luxurious foods that they are safe uh, from the lust of the belly. Eating simple foods, a lot of simple foods, and lusting for it in, in somewhat the same way can be your downfall as well. After all, Esau lost his birthright by lusting for some of that red stuff, simple lentil porridge. Food itself is not blameworthy, but it's your desire for it that brings us down and ultimately replaces God. Philoxenus' final parody is of someone captured by the lust of the belly, which is now heavy in body in a continual fume and fog of food, attempting to participate in worship and prayers. He has trouble standing up to pray and staying steady on his feet and even more trying to stay awake and alert. So his spiritual antidote, remember he had all those uh, and uh, 50 antidotes uh, for uh, spiritual ailments in his first um, in his first meme row. Um, his spiritual antidote is not to eat too much food and so reduce the heaviness of one's body and therefore increase the lightness of our being for pure prayer. He says, let us not desire a full table with too much food so that the table of the kingdom might receive us as ones who are famished. Okay, coming to a little bit of a conclusion. Still the question is, why gluttony, the lust of the belly? It seems too mundane, uh, a little too worldly um, to be applied for the progression towards perfection. But as he says in a number of ways, Gluttony is the beginning of all sin. It is a psychomatic stumbling block, not only to physical health, but also to spiritual vitality and divine knowledge. In the physiology of, of asceticism, the lust of the belly leads directly to the spirit of fornication and then to even worse spiritual malaise. This is not uh, 
a Manichaeistic uh, dualism at play, that is the evil body versus the pure spirit. Nothing is wrong with food, he keeps emphasizing. It is a matter of how you eat, of not allowing desire to have control over you. And his favorite scriptural uh, example um, is of Daniel and the three young men who are groomed for greatness at the Persian court. And what makes them rise to the top is that it's the right kind of food that matters most, not rich foods, but simple fare. So in the two long memre on gluttony, fasting, salmo, is not the primary focus. In fact, it's almost never mentioned since the most difficult of sins develop in situations where the individual does not recognize the dire consequences and sinfulness of what he is doing. Philoxenus warns against the delusion that if the monk believes he has con conquered the rich and fancier foods that he has defeated gluttony. No, one must be alert even more to the temptations of eating too much plain, regular food. Once one is in control regarding plain food, then the challenge of richer foods is a moot point. A later figure in, in uh, Greek monastic spirituality and, and someone who read quite closely Evagrius, um, mentioned him earlier, is John Clemicus uh, in the seventh century um, at uh, the uh, St. Catherine's in Sinai. He similarly places his greatest worries around the time when his monks are not normally fasting. The days to fear for the monk are in fact the feast days. Philoxenus does not address this situation himself directly, but his concern is also for the situation in which the monk's weaknesses indulge the lust of the belly under legitimate cover. So of course, Philoxenus' intention is to tame, transcend, and to be victorious over the lust of the belly. And that has become the new boundary line for his understanding of the ascetical and monastic life. Um, we look at the Book of Steps, which also talked about the upright and the perfect and the movement towards perfection. Uh, the author, the anonymous author in the Book of Steps, required celibacy as the absolute requirement for entry uh, into uh, perfection, a decision which leads to an, uh, an authentic commitment typically is su of sufficient stringency that one cannot make it with half measures. So it is difficult uh, to give up one's family in the Book of Steps, but gluttony is the beginning of all sin and the rejection of its control over one's body and soul necessitates at first a clear and uncomfortable transformation of one's entire being, spirit, mind, soul, and body. The battle has moved inwardly where gluttony plays out its beguiling challenge. I would like to venture that conquering first the lust of the belly or being able to progress spiritually is much more difficult and demanding than requiring celibacy. And that's a point to ponder and to discuss. Now this emphasis upon gluttony and then fornication uh, does seem to take us back to the perception that Philoxenus was attempting an Evagrian model of sins and vices in the construction of his memory. However, given that there is no clear manuscript evidence for a continuation of the discourses, I suggest that this is all Philoxenus is intended to write and deliver. Willing to be corrected in the future. Uh, the practical skills of prayer and fasting and, and worship can be left to other hands because if you have extinguished the all-consuming lust of the belly, Loxenus keeps saying, everything else is a piece of cake. To that, 
May all God's children say, amen. Thank you very much for your attention. Myself, thank you, Dr. Kitchens, for um, a really well done presentation of a really meaty, <laughs> sorry for the pun using the term, but a really <laughs> broad and uh, um, well done summary of a lot to unpack. Um, you know, the, I think the first piece that I think really resonated with me is around the fact that our belly overwhelms the remaining of our senses. Uh, a few weeks back, I had the opportunity to do a baptism, and when we actually uh, place the chrism on a child, we place it across all. We place across across all their senses: their mind, their eyes, their ears, their arms, and then we also do one on their belly. And I always thought it was interesting because how can we perhaps sin from our belly, or how can that even be possible? But um, knowing how I am sometimes, especially after a long service, and how hungry I get, that it's almost amazing how. Uh, your mind almost becomes uh, inebriated with the fact of getting food. And if any of the listeners ever experienced the end of a conclusion of a, a great and holy Lent, that how <laughs> probably gluttonous you become in terms of the first meal you have and how big of a feast it is. And I think there was something that was written either in the um, the text that you wrote or around the more Philoxenus around the feasts are what we have to yeah, that's right. worry about. It's not the fast, but the feasts. And can, you comment, can you comment a little more about that? Uh, just that the nuance, because I think we always look at yeah. feast days as a way of celebration. Oh, we finished, we're end of our Christmas feast or the resurrection. But talk about this idea of being always disciplined uh, and to be able to have that um, ability to be tempered, which is, I think, what he's trying to explain to his, as you put it, uh, lay people who are wearing these uh, uh, yeah. ascetic well, and it is, like clothing. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, I, I, in doing research years back for this, I, um, you know, I was reading, um, you know, the Clemic, John Climacus's, uh, you know, the ladder of divine ascent, and that's where he mentions this uh, about the fact that the feast days are the most problematic. Um, it's easy when everybody's attention is focused upon times when one needs to fast. Um, but when it is a feast day, and just as you're saying, it is a celebration. Um, it's, uh, it's meant to be breaking a fast. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's when we can go uh, overboard and, and lose, lose some control. I know in our churches, uh, we used to have the expression, we, we would always have coffee out. Um, or fellowship hour after yeah, after worship, and it was very you know I laid a lot of stress upon it. Uh, I said you know for a long time I used to say that our worship is not completed until we gather together downstairs in our fellowship hall. Um, you know for fellowship, there was um, coffee and tea usually, but uh, often uh, someone would bring a few cookies or sweet rolls or whatever it might be. Um, usually wasn't a, a, a big meal, but nevertheless, there was always that, that kind of uh, you know, connection. Uh, I think that's, that's part, of, part of the whole thing. It's not food itself that is the issue. Uh, we need food in order, to, uh, in order to survive. And of course, in our world today, where we know that many people do Millions and millions, billions perhaps, do not have adequate food. It is always, um, you know, a concern for us, um, or it needs to be a concern for us. But it's the it's the attitude towards that, um, and where the, your belly is your god for that moment is, uh, you know, is a concern. I, when I was in seminary. Um, our systematic theology professor was a Paul Tillich student. And so we read Paul Tillich. Mm. Paul Tillich talks about the ultimate concern, which is God. But he says the problem is with human beings is that we often erect, I'm not sure, I can't really remember his precise term. We were, we were erect smaller ultimate concerns uh, along the way that are more important to us. 
prestige, honor, fame, money, um, a good home, um, and food. <laughs> um, being able to, you know, to eat well um, and luxuriously. So there's, it's, it's again, it's, it's an issue of how do you define when you are, um, when you have replaced your, your need for, in this case, food with uh, a lust that blocks out everything else that you're doing. Yeah, and that's, that, that, that's, yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's a pause for thought at a number of times, particularly, uh, I guess, as, uh, you know, in Canada, we've already had our Thanksgiving. Uh, it's about a, uh, quite a month from now for American Thanksgiving. And uh, yeah, it's another yeah. occasion. You know, Dr. Kitchen, I would I would want you. You'd certainly invited to come to uh, to come to my parish anytime liturgical worship. And I think as we uh, go forward, you know, what I always remind uh, members, especially uh, our our those who are born in the Western context, that the the liturgy uh, is not complete, as you said, until there's a liturgy after the liturgy, as uh, Father Father yeah. Alexander Schmemann would say, and that it's amazing as a priest that our eyes are always watching, even not only during liturgical worship but even afterwards, and how. Um, you know, perhaps if you and I were at the same parish, we'd be watching everyone during this time to see how they behave. You know, what is the Christian-like way of doing it and how um, even simple things like our food sp says a lot about us and how, how that yeah. all works together. So it's just a fascinating um, call-out uh, opportunity for us to be self-aware around these small things that um, are wedded throughout our liturgical tradition in the psalm, uh, psalmody around the gateway where the evil one can enter. And uh, it's not just through our eyes and our ears, which we often focus on, or our mouths, as uh, at more Jacob, St. James says, around uh, the tongue being the rudder, but around us, uh, around that. So fascinating piece around this belly. Um, yeah. I have a couple more questions uh, for us to think about, uh, especially in this modern times, we focus so much on nutrition and uh, our health. And it's no surprise that today, the, the science shows that there's a very close connection between nutrition and health. And uh, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the United States, I think a, about a third of our population are um, would be considered obese. Um, can you speak a little bit more about this connection that I believe the Orthodox Church speaks about that we don't silo the mind, the body, and the soul? Instead, mm -hmm. uh, Orthodox liturgical worship is a very full body experiential uh, experience. And comment about what you glean from uh, Mar Felixinos and also from your um, experience around how uh, inextricably connected all these components are to the whole body and how, uh, as St. Paul says, we are the temple of God, that we are as in itself a church among the church in, in that way. So can you comment a little bit more about the connection of the mind, body, and soul, the comments that he speaks about in terms of simplicity, and expand a little more about, about that so that our listeners can understand how it's not just about one thing or another, but all things are all connected. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and actually it's very difficult to be able to, um, you know, to, uh, to put that all in a very neat little package, but indeed they, they are. And uh, uh, I actually, I guess I would, you know, the concern for nutrition and for the right kinds of food um, are, are both appropriate and indeed at times a certain sign of the, the lust of the belly because uh, the fact that we eat well or eat the right kinds of things, don't eat the wrong kinds of things, the junk food or whatever, mm -hmm. um, is sometimes, uh, you know, again, focusing all attention upon, you know, that if we eat right, we are right. No, I don't think so. I think we have we have a lot more elements. Uh, one good example of this, uh, and I think, and Philoxenus mentions it several times along the way, um, is uh, is the athlete. Yeah, uh, an athlete um, when he or she competes in some some sport, some event, needs to be able to. Um, uh, have all of these elements um, 
you know, improper, uh, improper balance and order. Um, an athlete's body can be perfectly trained, um, and very fit. Uh, but if your spirit, your, your, your sense of uh, self-worth um, is lacking at that particular point, you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to give up. You're going to let somebody else go ahead of you. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're not going to, to do, uh, perform as well as, um, as you possibly could. Uh, it is a, you know, spirit, mind, and, and body uh, that, that do uh, carry us forward. And they have to be in, in coordination with, you know, with one another. Um, so it's, it's, uh, again, I think we have to, um, you know, when we see people, um, who are, um, you know, who have various kinds of, of problems, um, some of it is because of the lack of proper nutrition. Some, of, a lot of it is, uh, because of, you know, the, not having a, a good image of themselves, um, and no sense of hope. You know, there's a, there's a variety of ways in which we've got to, to work to have all of these things, um, you know, as, as one, one force. That's why the, the, the lust of the belly is a problem, um, as he points out, because it opens the door to all these other things. If we, if we have control over, uh, and, and this to me, uh, you know, preaching to myself, you know, as well. If we have control over the lust of the, uh, over our, over our belly, then we're going to have control over a lot of other things that come and challenge us. If we don't, then it's, you know, just, yeah, you know, it's not so much bring it on, but, you know, we, we then don't know how we don't have the, uh, you might say the, the spiritual skills, almost like a physical skill. We don't have the spiritual skill to be able to, to uh, push off these, these other things of anger and grief, of uh, love of money and, and um, whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah, really fascinating uh, comments that you make. And it definitely, it's not a, you know, a simple tie of the bow. Um, our, our liturgical tradition and our ascetical tradition gives us plenty of opportunities. And uh, I often ask people that it's not just the Great Lent that we have this time to turn on this behavior of saying no to food. But in mm -hmm. our tradition, we have Wednesdays and Fridays where we have times to be able to say no uh, to certain things. And we often say that in the form of meats. And it was commented on uh, in uh, Mark Philoxenus's work in the translation that I read is around as you said, it's not the meat itself, but it's around this idea about having restraint, about saying no uh, when there's so much food readily available and literally every traffic stop you can get food available to you. Yeah. Um, but to be able to say no and to know that it's not just some, something that we, it's a part of a lifestyle. Can you turn it on or off? And if you can't, it's not something to be guilty about. It's something to be very self-aware about that this may be a cross or a place to focus in on because the, the, the desired benefit is that if I can say no to those things, then I have the discipline to hear what the Father through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about. And so it's just a, all these small little things that we have are the way that God gives us an opportunity to become better disciples. It's not just simply a you say no to a, you know, a, a, you know, a burger on the street and you're suddenly a good person. <laughs> no, it's the... It's the virtue of the person inside and your character. And, uh, you know, it, it just, I think it's just, it's just another place, another opportunity in how wonderful God has created us that it becomes a lever for us to use as a part of our worship, not just simply as uh, that's something that's not a part of faith, it's for the nutrition hacks or all these folks, but really it's something that's really a, a core to our, uh, uh, an opportunity for us in our faith. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a really, I mean, one of the things that and I know in the last um, 30, 40 years, the, the growth uh, of uh, food banks um, has uh, had, an, I think, uh, an important effect 
uh, upon local congregations. Um, I was in a church where we uh, we helped initiate the uh, first food bank in our in our community, um, and it was and it, at first it was a little we had to kind of it was going uphill um, against uh, the community's uh, ideas, um, and it's part of the problem is is that it's a never ending never ending issue. Uh, it also raises the issue when we realize finally how much extra food yeah. is out there um, in the stores that's being uh, disposed of uh, because of uh, you know other kinds of sanitary um, laws, oh. and yet people are not able to um, you know, people who need them uh, are not able to, uh, to take advantage of that food. Um, so I mean, we're you know, food does have a uh, you know an important um, important element in our in our spiritual life. It is the beginning uh, of where we are um, where we're going, um, you know, spiritually, and um, it's also not the end. Yeah, just simply to have just as. Uh, Philoxenus says on a couple of occasions, just to think that, uh, oh, I, I, I've conquered all the rich foods, whatever they were in those <laughs> days, uh, whatever they would be. I guess we, you know, we cut down on our filet mignon, you know, something yeah. like that. That's, that, that's barely getting started. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, it's, it goes far beyond that. You know, it is it is something for all of our listeners to also be mindful of, especially after we get done a liturgical service and we have coffee hour when we did have it during a, a pre pandemic time the how much food is wasted. It speaks yeah. about, you know, it speaks about us, about, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have a, I have an Indian heritage and food and hospitality is so important part of it. And mm -hmm. even uh, people get a lot of value about being able to be hospitable to people. But to find right. the balance of like saying like how do we just make sure that at the end of the day um, we're not over indexing and then causing waste and I think you bring up a really great opportunity for listeners, uh, especially around serving the poor and even more Felixino's comments about poverty being a a potential source an opportunity especially for those who are poor they have the ability because they don't have the luxury of abundance that they can if they do splurge they can return back and for us to be able to a witness the value of food, just like we witnessed the value of a dollar um, and to see like that is in itself a blessing and a, a way for us to turn, um, turn to God. And uh, another opportunity for us to even just say, why do we pray before? Why do we offer grace before a meal and offer mm -hmm. grace after the meal, right? So that we are anchoring that experience as again, God is present. And so many times, as you mentioned in the, in the writings that the, that the glutton uh, only way he acknowledges God is just by being silent. But uh, in reality, it's it's actually a uh, it's a cover up of actually where they really are. It's actually they're very guileful and very uh, cunning in that way. So it's just interesting to, uh, to to kind of think through the meal process. It's, it's a, I mean, the thing that Philoxenus does here is, is I guess a classic example of um, uh, I guess this is a classic example. I'm not much of a literary. Uh, um, uh, literary uh, person, but uh, it's definitely a case of satire um, in which he does to a degree um, overblow, you know, who the glutton is. But that, of course, enables us to recognize um, here and there some of uh, that some of the glutton that he's talking about mirrors problems that we have. Yeah. We haven't gone very far with them, but hey, that possibility is is always there. So you've got to uh, 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 that that's the virtue of this particular homily, and I think this one more than all the others um, in his collection, um, you know, personalizes uh, you know the uh, the issue. Um, the others he talks about, uh, you know, faith and simplicity and the fear of God and renunciation. And, and of course, there's a application to uh, to each of the um, 
um, you know, to each of the, uh, the monks and or other people who are reading it. Um, but it's, uh, uh, but this one I think really strikes home because everyone is hungry at some point or another. And then where do we go from there? Yeah, I think the the last question that I will uh, that I will provide in the time that I have is uh, one thing I've always learned about uh, anyone who takes the academic route and um, identifies a church father to uh, to focus on when they're doing their PhD work. It's kind of interesting that your story with your relationship with Mar uh, Philoxenos is a uh, more circumstantial. You had a professor that mm -hmm. encouraged you to read it. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about your relationship with him. And it sounds like a really awkward question, but. Um, <laughs> You know, because it's you know fifth century, sixth century. Um, but tell me what your relationship is with him. You know, as, as you read, what do you think he was like? Uh, and I think about this question whenever I read. Uh, you know, Moravania, Saint John Chrysostom is one of my favorite church fathers, and I use him a lot in terms of inspiring me for my uh, homiletical messages that I give to uh, to my uh, parishioners. Uh, what was he like? Because you, know, the, the some of the things, the way that he we spoke about things were extremely funny, uh, satirical. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what? What, what was his personality like? What was his character like? If you were to surmise reading, not only just these discourses, but other things you have done in your study of him, what was he like as a teacher? What was he like as a uh, leader of these monks? Uh, comment a little bit about that so we can um, yeah. also understand well, how we develop relationship. Well, I, just to go back, it was Father Alexander Dulella, um, who was my advisor at Catholic U in the Semitics department. Uh, he was, and I think I mentioned this in my first lecture, um, he... Uh, in my second year, he just brought to me little pieces of different authors and different books uh, for me to read to kind of get the scope of Syriac literature. Um, and um, uh, and it's a uh, and and so you know what caught my attention with Philoxenus at that point I I can't really say I don't remember it's too long ago. Um, and, but I did, uh, particularly for my master's, I focused upon Philoxenus and did for, did for a number of years after that. Eventually, the, as I made the point <laughs> somewhere along the line, the, uh, the Liber Graduum, where the Book of Steps played the siren and um, seduced me into emphasizing that book. But I didn't give up Philoxenus. I think, you know, part of the context is to realize these discourses are, um, what most people feel are, are unique among Philoxenus's writings. They show who he, he is as a spiritual leader, as a spiritual father, um, without getting into all of this, uh, the Christological, you want to call it academic, um, yeah. uh, disputes, which were legion at that, in that time. And Philoxenus was at the center of it. Uh, Philoxenus, if you read some of his other letters, and he's talking about Christology, about who is Christ compared to who some what somebody else says Christ is like, uh, he's no um, he's no angel. <laughs> he's he's very strong in his language. Uh, you know, calls them idiots, calls them you know uh, dastardly people. Um, he's not um, he's not gentle. Mm. But here in this work, I think, you know, we do see that he is concerned for the development of their, uh, the, the monks and other spiritual life. Uh, he has a sense of humor that comes out more than just in, in this one passage, but this one is perhaps the, the best one. Um, and uh, so I think he's, a, he's someone who is primarily a, uh, pastorally oriented. He felt, uh, and I, I owe this thought more to uh, uh, colleague David Mickelson, who's now at Vanderbilt University, that um, Philoxenus felt that uh, if you are to lead the proper Christian ascetical life in the monastery, you had to also think correctly about who Christ is. If you had a warped idea of, of uh, the nature of Christ, mm. uh, that would also warp um, your your spiritual direction. 
And um, so it's, uh, you know, I think he, he was a pastoral, uh, pastoral thing. His, his works are almost completely letters to other monks, other monasteries. Um, there's a few exceptions um, in which he's trying to help them uh, redirect their, their thinking, redirect their, their way of life. What, a, what an amazing uh, way to way to conclude, you know, for us as listeners to think about ultimately at the end of the day, the, the context of uh, the fifth century, sixth century, especially around the Christological conversations coming out of Chalcedon. And for us to think about where uh, more Philoxenus was in and for us as listeners to also understand, do we have a true perception or conception of who Christ is, who is ultimately at the anchor or the, the, the center as a um, as a Christocentric church, do we have a true um, uh, you know, way of understanding who he is? And that's the the starting point. And everything else is uh, is, is is a bridge off of that. I want to uh, conclude here um, by just first of all, thank you for uh, an amazing um, an amazing uh, topic, amazing covering of this, the three previous Saturdays and concluding with this lust of the belly uh, discourse that you're able to provide for us. Want to thank uh, His Eminence more Timotheos uh, for the introductory message and uh, and ask that uh, that you continue to remember us as all those who are listening here uh, to continue to remember us as well. And we will certainly remember you as you continue to uh, educate us, to teach us, to inform us about the writings of the fathers and how they can continue to be uh, alive, uh, not only in the works, but through us and the way that we continue to take these pieces of spiritual advice and, and carry it forward. I'd like to also thank all of you uh, at home, uh, wherever you are, on your phone or on your cell phone or on your uh, laptop. Uh, quite a bit of conversation on the chat line, especially around um, that we're watching around, uh, is he uh, a saint in our church and other churches? At the end of the day, um, everyone, it's, uh, it's critical for us to be able to first absorb and to understand the writings of this father. And knowing that as Dr. Kitch has mentioned, that um, you know whether they are considered church fathers or doctors or things like that, there's still room to learn about uh, their writings and how it informs our faith. And so there'll be more to come around that, especially around the conversation around, um, you know, what jurisdiction, things like that. But for today's conversation, I just want to thank you once again, Dr. Kitchen. Uh, any, any, any concluding thoughts that you want to share with us before we, before we wrap up? No, this has just been a wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to, uh, one, to sort of goad me into thinking again, about uh, Philoxenus. Um, there's a couple new books that I'm looking forward to reading about uh, dissertations about Philoxenus. So this is a thing. And I think, yeah, he has he has a remarkable message. Um, and I thank you and the, the people at Orho uh, and all the viewers for their, their support and encouragement. Um, and I hope to, I uh, think, you know, keep, keep reading this Mm. Until there's no more reading. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you.